Okay. Welcome everyone. Welcome to Harvard uh, CMSA seminar, uh, Quantum Matter in Math and Physics. And uh, today we have a, a great honor to have uh, Lin Lin. And uh, he will be speaking about uh, F-theory part two on global structure from arithmetics. And let me just say a few words about uh, Lin. Uh, he uh, studied at the uh, uh, University of State Hedelberg in for PhD. And then he went to uh, uh, UPenn for postdoc. Uh, and then now currently he's in CERN. And I think uh, the topic, F-theory is probably a very advanced topic for uh, usual audience for the quantum matter. And I personally have a feeling uh, just before the talk, I think I just entertain the, the audience. I think in Chinese, there's a saying that said that uh, if something, some melody is too advanced, then there will be fewer people can appreciate and understand. I think the situations reflect very well. Usually the audience will be like 70 people or so, or 80, even 100 or 200. But today, I think the topic is really too advanced. So most people get scared. And uh, I think Lin grew up in uh, Germany. So I think he can appreciate like music like Bach is very uh, beautiful. But if you check a lot of YouTube video, like Bach's music are so Take over. Okay, sorry, Joen. Um, sorry, I can't hear you anymore. It's my. Oh, you mean earlier you you were not hearing me? Yeah, I wasn't, but now I can hear again. Okay. I see. Huh. Okay, so should I start? Sorry about that awkward. <laughs> um, I don't know what happened. Maybe I say I do say a lot of things, but probably internet problem. Please. Okay. Hear me. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation. I, um, I really appreciate this um, offer to um, give a talk here about some of the works I've done in the past and also more recently. Um, so this will be part two in some sense of the bigger picture, uh, bigger two set story about F theory and recent advances in them. And Miriam has already spoken about some of the FIDO applications or phenomotivated you know, motivated studies, I should say, yesterday. Um, today, I'll be talking more about perhaps some more formal um, aspects. Um, and the unifying theme behind that is that uh, it, it has something to do with, as the title says, um, global structures, both in the geometric sense and also in the physical sense. So um, the, uh, yeah, so one of the lessons from the past 20 years of studying F-theory is that um, there's a beautiful interplay between physics and geometry that F-theory compactifications are teaching us about. Um, and perhaps uh, that something that also appeals to some of the more mathematically inclined people is that uh, some very um, elegant features of elliptic vibrations have been related through F-theory to now features of gauge theories and supergravity theories in high dimensions. Um, and Miriam has done a great job yesterday about um, with um, informing us about some of the advances for, as I said, for more of a um, phenomenology or oriented um, uh, program. Um, so one thing that um, appeared there was the topic of rational sections and these have been well studied in mathematics and they actually lie in the intersection with another part that uh, has probably less to do with physics, namely arithmetic. And in some sense, these are naturally global properties of the vibration in the sense that you really need the full information about the compact space rather than just uh, some local data in terms of, for example, some uh, co-dimension one singularities. And roughly in physics, what it translates to is, is in uh, our disc really discrete data of the physics, which you can also think about in some sense as global conditions that uh, some things has to up, add up to integers or, or, or you have to count a certain number of things to balance some charges. Um, so in particular, 
what I will focus on today is not so much the story that uh, about um, the yuan gauge symmetries that you get from the EV sections, but more about the really the global structure of the gauge group. That is to say that I will be concerned about gauge groups whose which have some part Z of the center modded out. So just to give a quick outline of the talk, I will review first some basic parts about the F-theory dictionary between geometry and physics. And then I will give hopefully a um, somewhat uh, basic introduction to the modal veil group of sections so that uh, maybe the melodies of this piece of music can be appreciated more easily to a, uh, to a broader audience. Um, the core part, then is about uh, what's known as a Shioda map, which plays a central role in, in the mathematics studies of these uh, sections and how they translate now in F3 compactifications to really the, the properties about the gauge group, as I said before. Um, in the second half of the talk, I'll then move to something more probably field theoretic that maybe the audience, members of the audience actually knows much better than I do. Um, where I'll interpret these uh, non-trivial global gauge group structures as really having gauge some center one-form symmetries. And I'll be concerned about uh, their anomalies and in particular how these anomalies can be related to certain structures you see from the geometry that you naively wouldn't have expected from a physics perspective. So um, since the, the, I guess to the audience is fairly broad and also it's a longer talk, I just want to give you the sort of the main aspects of the talk uh, in, in two slides. So in the first part, which is going to be more geometrically oriented and, and uh, maybe to that audience uh, more formal, uh, is that uh, we'll be studying um, rational sections, which are just maps from the base of the elliptic vibration into the total space. And as Miriam already said yesterday, this these kind of these maps form a discrete abelian group, the so-called model veil group. And um, part of the model veil group, namely the free part, um, gives rise to the U1 symmetries that um, will also appear in this talk. Um, but there's also then going to be this uh, torsional part, which will play a prominent role in the second part of the talk. Um, inside the study of these rational maps, the Schuler map, pops up, which is roughly a homomorphism between the model veil group and divisors in the elliptic vibration. And this map takes generally this kind of form where you have in particular linear combination of some integral exceptional divisors where the coefficients of that map, uh, of these, uh, of this linear combination are fractional numbers. And these fractional numbers um, translate now into certain restrictions on what kind of matter representations in FD are allowed. So you can interpret it now as a certain condition on what the character lattice of your gauge group is. Um, and also there's a dual formulation where you can view essentially this object defined by the Schilder map as a co-character of the gauge group. So that in total, this relation between the character and co-character lattice tells you what the gauge group actually is rather than just the gauge algebra. So what we'll see is that each generator of the model veil group, be it a free generator or a torsional generator, will in general define a non-trivial element inside the center of the gauge group, which has to act trivially on all matter states. So that in total, the gauge group is not just what one naively would think from a local analysis, namely some non-abelian gauge algebra times some um, abelian gauge algebra, but actually a non-trivial quotient where now every um, generator contributes in general to a non-trivial um, non relation that one has to mod out. Okay, so, so this is some older results um, based on the, this paper and it also goes back to some earlier works by others, um, but it sort of highlights this interplay between math and physics a bit more. And also it will set up the stage for the second part of the work uh, of the talk, which is about more recent work. Um, and that is based on some observation that the modal veil torsion in geometry is actually heavily constrained. 
in the sense that um, if I now just focus on the non-abelian part of the gauge group and the part of the center that uh, is just inside the center of the non-abelian gauge symmetry, then not all possible combinations for a G mod Z gauge group is actually realized in, in, in F theory. So the que immediate question that pops up is, is that a limitation of F theory or string theory? Or is it more of the sort that these gauge theories with gauge group G mod Z are just in the swampland, meaning that they are perfectly consistent effective field theories that simply have no string theory realization. And the answer to that, which I hopefully will, um, will provide with this talk, is that it really is neither of the two in the sense, as I stated above, but really it's a, this observation is pointing towards string universality. Namely, um, what having a gauge group of the form G mod Z means is that actually you have a gauge theory with gauge algebra associated to the simply connected group G, where you have gauged a one form center part, of the uh, one uh, gauged a part of the one form center symmetry. So in general, what we'll find is that in supersymmetric uh, theories, in particular in supersymmetric theories coupled to gravity, there will be certain obstructions to gauging this center symmetry that comes in the form of some mixed anomalies that involves ga other gauge symmetries which have to be there for consistency of the supergravity or supersymmetric field theory. Um, and if I now apply this to eight dimensions where the classification of possible gauge groups and modal veil torsion is known geometrically, what we find is that this requirement that the anomaly vanishes is actually structurally equivalent to the consistency condition for having certain types of modal veil torsion on K3 surfaces. So in that sense, um, these apparently consistent field theories with no realization in string theory actually suffer from some inconsistencies. And those which do not suffer from these inconsistencies are in one-to-one -one or almost one-to-one -one correspondence with what is known in geometry. Okay, so um, yeah, this, this is hopefully what I want, uh, what I would get to in the next hour and a bit more. So um, if there are no questions up to here, I'll now start with a review of the basic F theory dictionary. Okay. All right, so um, the basic geometric objects is studied in F theory is an elliptically fibered compact Calabria manifold and we'll take in the following the manifold to be of complex dimension three, four, or five. Um, in these cases, and as Miriam already mentioned yesterday, the non-abelian gauge algebra is related to some uh, certain canonical singularities over co-dimension one loci in the base. And if I resolve these singularities, I in general get some exceptional divisors, which are P1 fibered over these loci where the singularities were previously. And they form, these P1 fibers form the affine thinking diagram of the algebra G. Um, the non-affine components of these exceptional divisors, um, they correspond basically to the Catan generators of the, of the, of the gauge theory, or, in a different language, they correspond to co-roots of the algebra G. And the non-affine fibers, so those which are not the affine node of the thinking diagram, they correspond to the W bosons or the roots of the gauge symmetry. And the pairing between them uh, from, uh, in terms of the root and co-root pairing is geometrically just given by intersection. Uh, and in the case of these divisors and the fibers, the intersection product gives you the Kata matrix of the, of the uh, Lie algebra. And matter states typically are associated to now um, fibers, uh, uh, rational curves that appear only in higher co-dimension in the base. Um, and their, uh, their, their um, if you wish, Kata charge, so the, 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 the thinking labels that determine the weight of this matter state, uh, it's just given by the intersection number with these um, exceptional devices. Uh, 
So this whole story can be understood um, from basically the M duality between M theory and F theory, uh, where F theory uh, or where the M theory compactification on this elliptic Calabi-Yau is the, interpreted as a circle reduction of the F theory compactification of this Calabi on this Calabi-Yau. And through this duality, um, one can also identify the sources for genuine U1 theories, so uh, U1 gauge symmetry, so, you, so U1s that are not part of the Cartan subalgebra of some non-abelian gauge symmetry. And these are associated now to divisors, so could I mention one subspaces of the elliptic vibration that are sections. So um, what are sections? Sections is basically a rational map from the base into the total space, such that for every point in the base, it marks a specific point on the fiber over that point. And for it to be rational in some sense just means that this point, that marked point in every fiber must have some rational coordinates. So a example that I've chosen here to give is, if you imagine that you just embed the generic fiber of, these, of this elliptic vibration Y inside a weighted projective space 112 with coordinates U, V, and W in terms of the vanishing of this polynomial. And here, the coefficients B and C, these are holomorphic functions on the base. So now a a point on that fiber just corresponds now to some coordinate UVW, which satisfies this equation. And, for the, and furthermore, these coordinates have to be rational. Uh, and in this case, there are two easy to find points, namely one where each coordinate is actually a constant. And for the, the other one, you see that one can in principle allow for the coefficient to depend on the base coordinate, so long as it does in a rational way. And in this case, it does because this function B2 is actually a holomorphic function. Um, and as Miriam already said yesterday, the, the group of the, so the set of these sections actually form an abelian group, the so called model veil group. Um, so let me just give you a very basic introduction explanation of what this group actually looks like. So um, the group structure on an elliptic curve you can think about as being inherited from the natural identification of the torus as the complex plane modded out by some two-dimensional lattice. All right, so now I, if I just add points on this complex plane and then push it down to this quotient, I naturally can identify, uh, define an addition on this quotient, which is then identified with the torus fiber. So in this case, I'm not just first now just talking about a single elliptic curve. So more geometrically, you can understand this um, if you uh, express the elliptic curve through its so-called Weierstrass form. So this is just a cubic polynomial with uh, um, coordinates x and y and coefficients f and g, where f and g must be some uh, elements of a certain field K, which you can think about in this case, just as, for example, the rationals, or say rational adjoint by square root of two or, or something like that. Um, and a K rational point just is a point that is labeled by the coordinates X and Y that satisfy this equation, such that these coordinates are inside this field you've chosen. And these points are now can be shown to be closed under a addition law, which can be defined geometrically. So geometrically, it's, uh, the, the cubic polynomial here defines a curve that roughly looks like that. And any straight line in the plane will generically intersect that cubic curve in three points, possibly at infinity if the curve, uh, if, the, if the cubic takes some special um, uh, sorry, if the straight line lies in certain special positions. And the three points that intersect basically satisfy this rule under the addition law. All right, so A plus B uh, can be geometrically constructed as this point C here. Um, and similarly, you can have um, also, yeah, so-called tor torsional points, uh, basically by, uh, constructing tangent lines at, at points of uh, 
a vanishing slope or vanishing uh, um, uh, at inflection points. So a vanishing slope, it gives you something like a um, two torsional point and at the inflection point, you get a three torsional point. So this is roughly how you, one can think about the addition law on the elliptic curve. And for elliptic vibration, one just has to do this procedure fiber-wise. So an elliptic curve, the group of rational points form this modal veil group, which is known to be finitely generated. And by that, I mean there is this decomposition of the group into a free part, which with finite many factors of z, and a torsional part with finite many factors of z mod zn. And these opt the, this group has been studied for a long time in number theory and arithmetic geometry and has received, well, I mean, it, it's been applied heavily in cryptography. Um, in algebraic geometry, one wishes also to think about elliptic vibrations, so high dimensional um, varieties where there's an elliptic curve structure. And these can simply be regarded as an elliptic curve over a field K which is identified with the field of rational functions, so essentially polynomials uh, and, and ration, uh, sorry, a quotient of polynomials on the base space of the vibration. And in the case that B is a algebraic variety of dimension one or two, that has been actually proven explicitly in math that the associated um, uh, model variable group is also finitely generated. So it also takes this kind of, this form here. And uh, one way to prove this purely geometrically is what uses this called Shioda map that has been introduced by Shioda in for four surfaces. So base dimension one and by Vazir later on for base dimension two. And um, so this, as I said, this map can be constructed pure, uh, purely geometrically, but in some sense, using F theory, there's actually also a physicist way that you would naturally arrive at that map. And it has to do essentially with U1 gauge symmetry. So, sorry. So, um, yeah, so how does this proceed from a physics perspective? Well, a section basically defines a copy of the base inside of your total space. Um, and since it's an elliptic vibration, the base has one dimension lower than the total space. So it's a co-dimension one sub-variety, which is a, um, also called a divisor. Uh, and there's a distinguished copy from the zero section of the elliptic vibration, which can be identified via the duality to type to B as a type to B compactification space. Sorry. So the divisors on an elliptic uh, vibration or in general on any um, algebraic variety form a group, the so-called neuron severi group. And on a smooth Calabiao, this neuron severi group is basically just integer one comma one form. Right, so these are integer, harmonic forms. And if you hear the word harmonic forms in Kaluza Klein reduction, usually the alarm bells ring and you immediately are looking for some massless vector fields or some massless degrees of freedom in the non-compact space if, if you reduce some higher form fields along these harmonic forms. And in M theory in particular, you have a three form, which if you reduce it along these harmonic two forms, you get a vector field in the non-compact space-time dimensions which correspond to some U1 gauge, uh, gauge field. And we have seen before already one instance where this appears, namely when these one comma one forms are associated to the exceptional devices that resolve the co-dimension one singularities, these U1 gauge fields become the Cartan fields of the non-abelian gauge symmetry. So one might be tempted to say, well, now I have these additional sections. They gave me also a divisor. Surely these now they are independent from these exceptional divisors called I mentioned one. So surely these will give me now actually genuine U1 uh, gauge symmetries in F theory if I uplift them. But actually this does not proceed directly. Um, instead, 
one needs to consider a slightly modified divisor class, which is called, uh, I call it here phi of x. And this phi of s has a linear part in s, but also has certain correction terms. And these correction terms are physically motivated by the requirement that the intersection number of this phi of s with a generic torus fiber and with any lift of curves in the base by the zero section is zero. Um, this, this bunch of words you can think about physically just as a requirement that as you go from the one lower dimensional M theory compactification to the one higher dimensional F theory compactification, this U1 gauge field lifts in a way that it respects the Lorentz symmetry in the higher dimension. This last condition where phi of s intersected with the co-dimension one fiber uh, has to be zero can be just understood as requiring that the W bosons of the non-abelian gauge theory have charged zero under this U1, which is reasonable since you want to really have a genuinely orthogonal U1 symmetry from the non-abelian gauge symmetry. So if you implement these conditions here, then there is essentially a single way to write down this phi of s. And it takes a form of the divisor class of s minus the divisor class of the zero section plus a piece that is a pullback from the base. Um, and these, these three parts are essentially determined by the, these two conditions about Lorentz symmetry. And the final piece that we'll spend more time elaborating on is this part here, which is a linear combination of the Cartan divisors of the non-abelian gate symmetry, where these coefficients L alpha turn out to be fractional numbers in general. So um, one should say, I should say that um, this can also be determined from um, an alternate perspective using anomaly cancellation conditions in 60, which is particularly powerful. Um, the assessment done in, this in these works um, but the point is that either way from these two kind of physics, very physics motivated perspectives, you arrive at an object that takes exactly the same form as has been constructed by the mathematicians using completely different motivations. And basically the motivation from the math perspective is, um, is this here, namely this phi is constructed in such a way that it is a homomorphism, meaning that if I take two sections and then add them up inside the model veil group, then it should just correspond to the divisor sum in the geometry of the two corresponding divisor classes phi. And the significance of this map is actually to show that the model veil group of an elliptic vibration is isomorphic to this quotient of the neuron severi lattice by a finite, uh, sorry, a finite index sub lattice inside of it. Um, and yeah, why is this important? Well, it is known from general arguments about algebraic varieties that um, the neuron severi group is finitely generated. So from this isomorphism, you immediately conclude that also the model veil group is finitely generated. So phi, as I said, plays this crucial role in showing the model veil theorem for, uh, uh, for, for elliptic vibrations from an alge algebraic perspective. And in some sense, you know, if we had known about F theory maybe 20, 30 years earlier, maybe a physicist would have come up with this map and proved this in, 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 in passing. Well, not in passing probably, but uh, uh, would I also be close to have stumbled across this relationship. In any case, um, let me go back now to the more physics-oriented um, um, properties of the Shioda map. So first of all, if I take the Shioda map of a free generator, meaning uh, it, it's the part uh, Z to the R here, then as we just said earlier, the divisor class phi of S will give you a U1, which uplifts properly to a U1 in F theory. And you have, in general, for each free generator, an independent U1. Moreover, the charges of states, which correspond to M2 brains wrapping the some co-dimension two fibers, can be just computed via intersection theory of that particular curve with that 
um, with with uh, with the shielded map of the section. Um, and moreover, since the neuron severity group is torsion free, it is also means that phi for a torsional section has to be necessarily zero inside the neuron severity group. So um, at, um, it first of all, it does not give you an independent U1. Um, one might be quick in concluding that this has then no physical relevance, but it actually turns out to be uh, quite the opposite, as we'll see now. Um, so uh, let me just flash again here the general form of the Shiota map. So first of all, this vertical piece um, is determined um, essentially by the properties of one of the property, one of the requirements about Lorentz symmetry in the uplift. And it can be computed explicitly, but it always intersects curves in the fiber with intersection number zero. So um, for the purpose of the following discussion, they're, they're rather uh, irrelevant. On the other hand, this piece in the middle um, is quite crucial. Uh, namely, these coefficients L alpha, they are fixed by the requirements that the W bosons of the non-abelian gauge symmetry are uncharged under the U1. And they can be explicitly computed by this formula, uh, where you notice that the inverse of the Carter matrix associated with the gauge algebra appeared. And because of that, this quantity L alpha is in general fractional if the section S and the zero section do not intersect the same co-dimension one fibers. So if that number here is non-zero, then you will get some fractional coefficients L alpha. So for example, if just think about the gauge algebra being SUN, then in general, these L alphas will be fractional numbers over N. Um, so now let's just take this explicit um, expression here and rewrite it slightly by putting S minus S zero on one side and phi and this combination L alpha on the other side. Then in terms of intersection numbers, this part gives you a linear combination of the U1 charge and the Dinkin labels of the weight, but it comes with these fractional coefficients. On the other side of the equation, you just get an intersection number between a holomorphic curve and an integral divisor. So you know this has to be integer. So now you get a correlation between the U1 charge and the Dinkin labels of your state under, uh, under the non-abelian algebra related by this integrality condition, which for in general fractional L alpha is non-trivial. Um, and this also applies straightforwardly to the case where the section you consider is torsional. In this case, as we said, phi of S is zero, so there is no associated um, U1 or U1 charge to speak of. But nevertheless, you see that the equation now becomes just about the integrality of this particular linear combination of the Dinkin labels of the weight. So in other words, this restricts the possible representations in which these weights transform it. So um, more abstractly, one can understand this in, uh, integrality constraint as a non-trivial co-character of the group of the algebra G and the U1 that has been introduced to the Shiodama. map. And um, because now you have to require that any character, so any allowed element of the weight lattice has integer pairing with its co-character, this restricts the possible allowed representations. And you can show straightforwardly, um, as, we, as has also been done in these works, is that for each free model variable generator, this co-character defines now a central element, an element of the center of G times the U1 that is generated by the section, such that this center element acts trivially on all representations. 
And the order of the center, center element uh, is just given by the smallest integer such that all the um, fractional coefficients inside the shielder map um, multiplies to an integer with this coefficient. So for example, in the earlier example of SUN, in general, K uh, kappa is just N. Um, the same story applies for the torsional sections, uh, except that in that case, the center element just sits inside the center of the non-abelian gate group. And the order of the center that is defined by the section is just the order of the torsion inside the model variable. Okay, so in, sorry, in summary, what happens is that it's the following. So um, if the elliptic vibration Y has a model variable group of this form, then to each generator, be it a free generator or a torsional generator, you can associate now a center element, which has to act trivially on all allowed matter representations. And this means that the gauge group now should really be the quotient of the simply connected or, or the, the uh, simply connected nominal abelian times the U1s modded out by all these center elements. Um, just to say that while in the presence of the torsion, each of these orders are fixed, it can of course be that uh, a free element generates a trivial center. But um, yeah, so, well, so, so. Link, can, can I ask yes. a question? Yes, please. Um, so for each free, more, so for each uh, uh, model by generator, we get uh, a quotient, we, 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 we for, 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 for each torsion of the generator, we, we quotient down the center. Could it be that mm -hmm. we get an additional quotient on the center of the actual gauge, gauge group, which is not coming from a model vial guy? Yes, very good. Um, I guess in principle that's possible. So let me say it differently. Like in, in this first work by um, Timo and Dave Morrison and company, they've only looked at the um, torsional sections, mm -hmm. right? So, so they concluded that the global gauge group is G times U1 modded out by the torsion part. But actually, as we've shown, no, also every free generator gives you such a relation. In principle, I don't know an argument if there might be other such relations imposed on the theory from other geometric objects. Okay, that's right. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, just maybe a, a small comment because it was related to Miguel's question yesterday. At this point, right, uh, because you applied it, say, for any SUN. Mm -hmm. There does not seem to be bound on the type of torsion yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, right. So far, yeah. I just laid out the general right. shape here. Uh, the, the kind of swamp uh, um topics will come in soon enough. Right, but indeed, from, from this argument, a priori, uh, the, 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 the torsion orders N are just given by the geometry and I have to take whatever it is. Um, yeah, so as I said, I, I'll come to that in a moment. So just to um, connect back to Miriam's talk yesterday, of course, the, 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 the as physicists, the kind of center quotient that everyone associates immediately is probably in the standard model. And this also happens in this um, F11 vibration that was featured prominently in Miriam's talk yesterday. Um, it realizes the gauge algebra of the standard model. And furthermore, it has a U1 gauge fact, uh, a, a factor. So there is a single modular generator S1 and its shield on map takes this form. Sorry, this here should be an SU3. So you see in particular that since there's a one half and a third, the smallest number that I can I multiply these with so that I get an integer is six. So by the previous analysis, it means that this shielder map defines for you an order six element inside the total center of this gauge group. And therefore the actual gauge group is the quotient by Z6. Um, and one should also say that this notation is a little bit sloppy in the sense that one really should actually 
specify how this subgroup Z is embedded inside every one of the centers. In this case, is exactly the way that one would one would typically could spec what the, what happens in the Senate mm -hmm. model, namely that you get exactly this embedding in such a way that the matter representations are have the quantization in terms of charges and their non-abelian representations, which uh, you observe in nature. Okay. Yeah. So this was the the part about um, the more geometric part. Um, let me just conclude this by now zooming in more on these kind of swamp blendy ideas. So first of all, um, let's stare again at this general form, including the U1s. Um, the complication that comes from U1s essentially is that these sections are typically more difficult to, uh, or in, historically has been not and analyze in the math literature with respect to this kind of intersection property of the Shoda map that defines a center. Um, so it's hard to make general statements about what allowed quotients there can be. Um, so I will in the following just ignore this part. So focusing on the modal veil torsion part. Um, that doesn't mean that in general the theory doesn't have non trivially acting center elements that sit inside both the center of G and the U1. But for the purpose of the talk, of the remaining part of the talk, it becomes handy if I just think about the gauge group as only having a non-abelian part that is quotiented by um, a subgroup of the center that sits just inside the non-abelian gauge group. Right, and as we just see, as you just saw, the this subgroup here precisely corresponds to the modal veil torsion. And for modal veil torsion, there's actually very, uh, there's a lot, there's been a lot of just um, math results in terms of how, uh, what there can be, and they've been classified. Um, yeah, they've been classified for K3s and more recently also studied in elliptic threefolds, which correspond to F theory in 60. There, it has been shown that the only allowed torsion is Zn with n smaller equal to 6, or Z2 times Z2, Z2 times Z4, and Z3 times Z3. That's it. Well, so one, one should add here that, of course, uh, there are some assumptions going in there um, and the, in this work, and the assumption concretely is that the elliptic color VR threefold is a compact Fold, which has no singularities that cannot be resolved preferentially. Um, so from the physics perspective, this is sort of reasonable since otherwise one would generally expect that these manifolds would lie at infinite distance in the, in the moduli space. So, so it do not actually define a, a good physical theory. Has anyone um, tried to explain these results that you're explaining for 60 in terms of some swamp plant condition or just observations? No. So this is this explanation here is really from the math perspective. Um, it has to do with uh, with the modular curve you can associate to um, to having a non-trivial torsion and and then categorize some 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 boundary behaviors which correspond to the appearance of some singularities and if those singularities are too severe then they say you cannot have that geometry but it's a purely geometric argument so indeed there is in 60 at least um not a direct analysis i hope that what in what follows i can shed a bit more light on that um i should say that this is in part also due to the fact that the non-abelian gauge group in 60 has more freedom to vary so all you i mean of course g has to have such has to be such that there has to be a there is a c subgroup of the center but other than that in 60 there is no um yeah as i said there's no strong correlation between what g in the presence of a certain z uh, this changes 
significantly for 8D. Could I just maybe say for Calabia or Fourfold, the story I would assume is really much less understood. Also, of course, yeah. So, so all there, our chance, right? Uh, again, indeed. when you focus on fourfolds, the story is indeed, really yes. quite open. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For for fourfold, I think it's even as I said, it hasn't been proven. I think strictly in geometry and in math that the model variable group is finitely generated. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, yeah. And so so all these kind of things maybe allow for some loopholes that give you some pathological cases, but nevertheless cases which go beyond naive expectation. But as I said, in AD, F theory to AD, which corresponds to compactification in the case of three surfaces, there's a very tight correlation between the gauge group and the possible modal veil torsion in the sense that basically everything has been classified. So for example, in AD, you know that the torsion can be all of the above and Z7, Z8, and Z4 times Z4, but that's also it. There's nothing with three factors, there's no higher than Z8 factor. And then get, given any Z, there's a complete list um, of possible co-dimension one singularities of K3 surfaces, which correspond to you know, the, whatever the gauge group will be then. So this is just a classification of Narayan datasets with uh, non-abelian extensions on what is the exact gauge group, right? That's not the right. Nothing right. Fancy. So so this is exactly so this is just a purely mathematical uh, classification based on the lattice uh, discussions in, right. in of K threes. Right. Exactly. But now you can interpret this in terms of the, what we just said about the global gauge group. Namely, first of all, you cannot have anything bigger than Z eight, which is already somewhat surprising. Secondly. If you look at the boundary cases, C7 and Z8, you find that there's exactly one K3. And that in the case of Z3, uh, C7, the K3 has a gauge algebra SU7 to the third, which is then quotiented by the diagonal Z7. In the case of Z8, the gauge group is slightly bigger, but there are no other possibilities. And similarly, for, for the boundary case of Z4 times Z4 or Z3 times Z3, also the possibilities are severely constrained. And for lower cases, you get more, but by far not all naively expected things from F theory. So for example, why is SU9 mod Z9 or any SUN mod ZN for that matter, not realized? So the question specifically now to in AD is, are these now in the swampland, or meaning that they are just not realized in string theory for some deeper reasons, or can we make this more precise? So in the remaining part, I hope I can answer that yes, we can do that, make that more precise, and actually show that our field theoretic constraints that explains almost all cases, I should say almost all cases, which are not realized geometrically or in string theory, more general. Okay, so um, before proceeding, since we'll now talk about these uh, one-form symmetries, maybe I should pause here in case anyone has questions about the geometric part. Okay. Okay, so um, the... Uh, Link, sorry, yeah. just... Uh, just uh, to point out, so um, in, in, in where we're about to, to finish with Comroom, we have mm -hmm. also constraints on, on the global structure of the standard model of the, of the, um, of the gauge group that you can get in eight dimensions. So for instance, we do get as well that SU9 over Z9 is, uh, uh, we, we find that one is, is not possible. Uh, okay. With, because of a combination of the Cobotism conjecture and, and the normal. That's uh, interesting. So I just, yeah, I just wanted to bring this up. This is very exciting. So we should probably. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so let's see how, how much of that translates into what we have. But basically yeah. there's, I, as I show this kind of anomaly arguments rule out these cases as well. That's great, that's great. Uh, Miguel, are you talking about different dimensions or only AD specifically in this context? So we're thinking 7, 7D, 8D and 9D. Um, so we have different constraints for, for those cases. I, I, I gave a talk about this, uh, a month ago, and also Kunrun briefly mentioned it in his talk at Strings. Um, 
I, I mean, I, we, we, we can share the, um, we have a table of, of the things that we can rule out. Um, okay. It would be, yeah, yeah. So I, I will have something similar in the end. So we can. Yes, yes, good. Okay, so, so yeah, let me get there as soon as, as quickly as possible without uh, losing too many of the audience members. Um, okay, so, right. So, so the modern perspective or a different, more few theoretic perspective about what a global gauge group structure means is that if I start with a gauge theory that has, so, so I, I don't want to just look at it in terms of the charge lattice because in few theoretically, a priori, I don't expect every element of the charge that has to be filled, although in quantum gravity we do, but for now let's just look at it from the field theory perspective. Instead, um, if I have a gauge theory that has gauge algebra G and no matter transforming under a subgroup Z of the center, then the gauge theory has a one form global symmetry. Um, and the difference between the gauge group G and G mod Z is actually just in terms of what we allow in for the um, for the for the gauge fields as we sum over them inside the path integral. So for gauge group G, I'm summing over all possible um, configurations corresponding to principal G bundles. But for G mod Z, I should sum over instead G mod Z bundles. And the difference is measured by an obstruction to lift the G mod Z bundle to the G bundle, uh, which is encoded in the so-called second for whitney class, which roughly speaking is just a two-form field, or more precisely a two-co-cycle that takes value in this finite, uh, finite abelian group Z. And if I sum over all the possible G mod Z bundles, it means that I'm summing over all the possible second Stiefel Woodney class. And the key inside of this work is now to interpret that this configuration, these, conf these possible configurations, should be identified with a gauge field of the one form Z symmetry. Or I should first say with a background field for the one form symmetry. So, and, and only if I sum over them, it gets the interpretation of a gauge symmetry. So I should mention that, of course, the charge, uh, talking about higher form symmetries, you necessarily have to talk about the charge object. And in the case of one form symmetries, in the center, these are Wilson loops. Um, and more generally, <clears throat> one form symmetries have, of course, just line operators under which uh, we charge under that symmetry. And um, one can study these also in um, field theory constructions from M theory or type to B on non compact LBLs, which correspond to just uh, <clears throat> five dimensional, four dimensional supersymmetric theories where gravity is decoupled. And one can detect these line extended operators geometrically by certain non compact cycles. And um, there's been some uh, recent works by, by, these, by these groups. Um, I should say that in these works, the one form symmetry is treated as a global symmetry of the field theory. But what we want to do now is really think about when we can promote this global symmetry to a gauge symmetry. So in general, the story is that this can only be done if the global symmetry has no anomalies associated to it. More precisely, one should formulate it in a way that says that basically the partition function of the theory cannot have any ambiguities once I turn on a non-trivial background for this global symmetry. Because if that was the case, then these ambiguities would make the theory inconsistent. So this just forces me plainly to not having any background fields. And if I don't have any background fields, then I can also not sum over them in the partition function. So for the center symmetry Z, G, a non-trivial background form for the one form symmetry induces a fractional shift for the instant time density. So roughly <clears throat> in, in some suitable normalized way of the instant time density, this fractional shift is parameterized by 
this cup product, or more precisely, it should be the Pontre eigen square, but roughly speaking, it's a quadratic operation involving this background field. And the fractional fractionality is measured by this coefficient alpha g. And for SUN, for example, it takes this form n minus 1 over 2n. Now, if you couple this instanton density to something which by itself enjoys a symmetry, then this fractional shift here will in general lead to some ambiguities of the partition function under that symmetry. So the case where this has been studied a lot is in four dimensions where the coupling, uh, the, the relevant coupling is the theta term, <coughs> uh, the theta angle coupling to the trace f squared. And the symmetry that I'm talking about here is loosely speaking the periodicity or the discrete shift symmetry of theta. So in particular, if I take as an example, a gauge group G equals SU2, then the instantons are integral and the um, periodicity of theta remains two pi. But if I now change the gauge bundle to SO3 bundles, which is SU2 mod Z2, then the instantons require, acquire a fractional part. They sit now in half integers. And consequently, this messes with the periodicity and changes it to four pi rather than two pi. Um, so this story now, we have generalized or tried to generalize to high dimensions. Um, and in particular, let's start with the discussion in 60, um, which will appear in a work with Fabio Bruzzi and, um, and Marcus Dirigel hopefully soon. And um, here we study really 60 n equals one gauge theories. And these famously have a dynamical tensor field bi, which couples to the instant density through this expression. And here uh, I should just say that the gamma labels a vector inside the tensor lattice of the 60 theory, uh, where the pairing is omega. And the tensor and the gamma vector is associated with the gauge sector uh, whose instant on density we're, density we're considering right now. So this coupling um, is well known as it le uh, cancels chiral anomalies of the 60 gauge theory through a generalized green schwartz mechanism. Um, and also for consistency of supersymmetry, these tensor field have a U1 gauge symmetry, okay? Um, so in analogy to the situation in 4D, let's consider in particular large gauge transformations of the B1, B, which amounts to shifting the B by a close two form with integer periods. So this is basically a generalization of not just a shift symmetry along the circle, but now to two form field. And if we turn on a background C2 for the one form symmetry, then the I4 here will shift by this uh, by this uh, fractional combination alpha g times c2 squared. And together with this shift, sorry, now in, in this background field c2, if we perform now this gauge transformation, then that leads to a shift of the action, which in general is fractional due to this coefficient alpha g and the combination here. Hey, yeah. Sorry, can I, can I ask a couple of questions? Mm -hmm. so, First, um, can I can I somehow try to um, uh, sneak my way out of the anomaly by saying that the lowercase b, it's not just any integer, it has to be you know like multiple of three or multiple of seven or something like that. Uh, you can try, but in general, that I mean, since it's a it's a large gate transformation, right? Sorry, oh, it's a gate right. transformation. You have to allow for all possible. Right, so that, that, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that it depends, uh, the, the, the value of V depends on the charge quantization, but I guess that's given to you by the lattice, by the, right? By the yes, tensor yes, lattice. Yes, exactly. right, right. Okay, good. So, uh, so let me say it differently. I, I, my interpretation is that actually, basically like the smallest increments you do here in this shift, that's defining for you the charge quantization of the strings. 
Okay, good. And it has to be because it's six dimensions. It has to be a. It has to be a. A self-dual lattice, right? Not necessarily even, but self-dual. Is that right? Yeah. Right. Uh, and, yeah. Yeah. And and the other question that I have is: Is it possible? So whenever you have an anomaly and on a discrete symmetry like this, one should worry about possible topological field theories that might cancel the anomaly. Right. Very good. Yes. Uh, I will get to that in a second. Okay, um, but the, the point is that this cannot happen Great. from Thanks. various perspectives. Indeed. Right. So, um, so just to conclude this uh, slide here, what essentially happens in 6D and 1,0 theories is that the partition function suffers now from an ambiguity if I perform a gate transformation for these tensor fields in the presence of a background field for the center symmetry. Right. And as Miguel was just saying, okay, could it be that this anomaly is canceled, absorbed by some counterterm, some topological um, sectors? And we've show, we argue in the work that this cannot be done. And in terms of the counterterms, you can see it by just realizing there are no um, local counterterms that you can add, which are invariant as a one form symmetry that absorbs this um, fractional contribution. Um, let me just also provide you more, maybe more a UV, as I, I would say it's um, some kind of a UV perspective in the sense that um, in six dimensions, the gauge instantons are really BPS strings. And as Miguel just said, they have, they come uh, with a quantized string charge. However, if I now have this coefficient here being a fractional number, then the instanton configuration that is induced by this background field would be a fractional string with respect to the quantization. So this is also, again, a signaling that you cannot possibly allow for such a background field if this is integer. Can I, yeah. can I, can I ask a question there? Yes. Um, so the, the, the string that we are creating with the Z2, with the boundary mean square of Z2, I mean, it's, it, the whole point of this is that it's not obviously gauge invariant under uh, uh, transformations, right, of the, of the C field and so on. So it, could, could it be that this fractional string is actually just, you know, it's attached to some sort of wall? So that could be a possibility that one way you can have things right. which they are quantization is if they arise at the endpoints of other of like objects with higher dimension. Um, right, right. But so then um, <clears throat> would these objects be consistent with the supersymmetry requirement? Oh, maybe not. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, uh, I think, so, so we also say that in the draft and I have to say that, um, Perhaps uh, Fabio is the better one to comment on this, but as far as I understand, the point of is that indeed these possibilities would be ruled out if you require supersymmetry to be preserved. Mm, okay. 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 Thanks. Yeah. Excuse me. Right. Yes. Uh, may you repeat? the anomaly that uh, you try to describe, the, the, the way you write maybe in terms of some invertible TQ of T or topological invariant like cobalt is invariant. Can you repeat that term? And then can you also repeat the argument you get that cannot be canceled by uh, a gap the TQ of T? Yeah, so, so essentially this, um, this term here, right, if you think about it, um, in terms of the 7D bulk, then this would arise if you had a three form field in the bulk, which on the boundary restricts to this. Behavior. Let me make sure. Sorry, let me just make sure. The little b is uh, two dimension, two form? Yes. And C2 is also, also two. two form, yeah. So the altogether is six dimension. Right. And then you write, you can interpret this in terms of uh, the, the partition function is not invariant. And there is a, a shift, fractional shift for yes. this term. And you should right. write this in terms of a seven dimensional term. Exactly. And the seven dimensional term I propose would be 
basically in terms of a now co-cycle, three co-cycle in the bulk, which on the boundary, in the boundary direction takes the value B. And this is a Z class of type of the uh, anomaly? Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, sure. I think Z class in general cannot be canceled by gap security, but only the, the torsion, the, the global anomaly may have uh -huh. security to be canceled. So Z is okay. usually is perturbative type of anomaly, right? It can be even captured by Feynman diagram. Um, I, 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 as a, uh, yeah, I, I guess. You, <laughs> okay. Right. Maybe, so maybe, yeah. We, <laughs> okay, so I, yeah. And then, all right, no problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Right, so, um, so as I said, right, the, these kind of PPS strings that are naturally there in 60 tell you that there is something inconsistent in terms of combining this fractional shift due to the background field for the one form symmetry with quantization of the string charges. And in general, what we find in explicit string derived models is that um, these strings also support in general massive excitation, which precisely break the center symmetry explicit, explicitly in the sense that they are charged under the center if this coefficient is not integer. So this is particularly interesting now from a kind of quantum gravity perspective. Namely, if you now think about this statement that the gauge group, uh, sorry, that, that the anomaly is preventing you to gauge the center symmetry, then it means the gauge group cannot be G mod Z. So now by the completeness argument, there must be certain representations present uh, in terms of excitations, in terms of some uh, dynamical states that transform non-trivially under the center. So these states explicitly break that one from symmetry which is also consistent with the fact that in the quantum gravity theory, you shouldn't have any global symmetries. So we see that at least in 60 explicitly, these um, strings play the role, play, play a central role. Um, and for more details, I'd refer you to the paper that um, with, with Fabio and Marcos. Um, and I should say that this kind of argument involving high symmetry symmetries has also been a major um, focus of, of recent research. Um, let's move to the AD case because that's where uh, we can make a very concrete um, comparison with the geometry. Namely, in A dimensions, there are only adjoint fermions in, in, in N equals one supersymmetry. So naively, any gauge theory should have a Z form, a Z one, uh, one form symmetry. Um, in, 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 in just plain AD gauge symmetry, there is no obvious uh, coupling to the um, involving the instanton density, at least not um, in the uh, vector multiplet. Uh, but if you include the gravity multiplet, so really talk about AD supergravity, then there is a natural coupling between a four form that is dual to the usual two form inside gravity multiplet and the instanton density. And just analogously to what we just seen in 60, this four form also enjoys a U1 gauge symmetry and its large scale transformations now would also lead to a fractional shift in the presence of a one form background field. Um, so, Excuse me. yes. I think I say something probably wrong earlier. Let me just make sure. I, I said okay. I made a probably wrong comment, but the, the one form symmetry, what's the, the the group here, it's a finite, so, right? Oh, no. Yeah, think about it as in terms of finite uh, ZK or ZN. Okay, but then in that case, the anomaly shouldn't be Z class. That's, that was my comment I was wondering because you have a ma Z somehow in that equation. So, so is that anomaly essentially global anomaly? It should be ZN class, non perturbative global anomaly, ZN. Right, right. Um, What's the so, anomaly? So, like um, how many copy of them will become trivial? Sorry, can you say how many, co how many copy of this anomaly become trivial? Um, so, uh, 
so what typically happens is that from my naive kind of continuum description intuition, this alpha G always comes with a fractional, uh, with a fractional denominator, which roughly is N for Zn, one form symmetry. So, so naively, I would have expected that it's M, right? Right, so, so N times this guy is sure? an integer. So that's why I've written this in this form where the fractional part, including the alpha G, has this contribution. Okay, thank you. But, but then this is actually a, a non-prototic global anomaly, not captured by Feynman graph. So okay. But, but, but how do you argue this cannot be canceled by T, K of T? Then that, uh, that argument just uh, repeat again, if you can. So, so again, I mean, so to my understanding, I could in principle lift all these, so the C2 is uh, in particular to now a Z class, right? Such that if I project to Zn, I get this um, expression. In that case, um, as I said earlier, I would have naively expected that you extend B into a three co-cycle in the bulk. And with these coefficients, that would give you this anomaly or th this contribution of the action. Does that make sense? Mm, I, I need to think of it, but, but I, I think uh, probably I get the meaning of this term. Do you know how to write this in terms of 70 invertible T of T? No, sorry. I, I, um, we haven't looked at this in detail. We, um, yeah, we're more focused on this kind of perhaps more conventional local counterterm argument. That's fine. Thank you. Maybe I can check with you after work. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I've been very much interested. Um, right. So I was here. Yeah. Okay. So, so in AD, I would expect a similar term. Um, and uh, we didn't explicitly analyze, but we suspect that there is a similar story also with counterterms in AD that essentially tells you that this cannot be in any way absorbed or, or um, canceled. So it poses a genuine uh, obstruction to gauge the center symmetry. And of course, if you're a skeptic, you might say, well, that's not very convincing. But I hope that by the end of the next slide, the latest, you will be convinced. Um, so the argument would, so first of all, I should say that in different to 60, in 80, the only moving parts of the story is just what possible gauge group there is because they're in, in front of this kind of, uh, uh, in front of this uh, integral here, there is no tensor charge, no, 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 um, yeah, no tensor charges, no string charges that could contribute in such a way that the fractional um, part here is canceled. So all you can do is um, find a gauge group G such that the combination of the center that you're gauging gives you a, um, a, a integer coefficient, which would be a necessary condition to have a gauge group G mod C. Okay. So for example, if you take just um, the gauge group G being SU n times n, then you could not only gauge the full z n times n, but also just a subgroup z n. And in that case, the background field for this particular one from center is just m times the basis, the, 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 the basic background field for the full center. Um, so the, this coefficient m appears here in front of the factor, and because this is quadratic in C2, what effectively happens is that now the anomaly comes with this coefficient alpha g, g s u m n times m squared. Okay, so already here, if I now just consider g a simple Lie group, and with the assumption that the rank of g is smaller or equal to 18, which is another swampland idea that is based on other arguments that were taken as an input, then I find that these would be the only simple gauge factor groups that have, don't have this anomaly. 
Okay. And in this case, one you could ask, okay, how are these realized geometrically in F theory? Well, at first glance, you might, it turns out that only the SU16 mod Z2, SU18 mod Z3, and spin32 mod Z2, only these three are realized in terms of an actual K3 vibration. But of course, in 8D, there are also other string compactification, um, uh, most notably the CHL string. And these two and that guy should fit in there without any issues. Um, I we suspect that also uh, these SP mod Z2 should be in there, although um, we haven't checked that explicitly yet. But um, sorry, Lin, can I ask? So you're saying that uh, so in the in the CHL string you can have SPN groups. You're saying that these things th these guys are allowed actually. Yes, right, exactly. And I agree with, the, with what we get. okay, very good. Okay, so then then wait, let me see what you say to these two cases. Because these two cases are also allowed by this anomaly, but they, they clearly, just by counting rank, they go beyond the limit of CHL, which is rank 10. Right. So, right. So, yeah. So, for, okay. for this one, yeah, we don't, we, we, so the constraints that we have allow them, but indeed, there's probably better constraints that, that, okay. that, that fill this. You cannot get this PM with rank bigger than. You cannot get SPN with maximal rank in 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 a dimension. Right. Indeed. So so I, I agree. I would have also said that because of the rank argument for CHL, those two are not realizable, but from this anomaly argument, it seems they are. Um, so there are some caveat, of course, but nevertheless, you see that this argument already cuts down a huge part, essentially all possible SUN mod Z N are disallowed by this argument. Uh, sorry, wrong direction. Um, let's just take it a little bit further and compare it explicitly with the geometry again. Um, here, let's just focus on K3s that have IN fibers, um, in which case the gauge will be just a product of SUN. Right. And, and just as a reminder, the IN fibers consist of a loop of N nodes in, in, uh, in, the, um, in the resolved geometry. And you can basically characterize an L torsional section by the component K, which is met by tau. So there's, I should start counting from the affine node, which is zero, and then in either direction of this loop, I go and start with one, two, up to n minus one. And whatever the uh, number is that is met by this section, that's k. And already uh, there's an in, 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 in constraint from this intersection structure, namely that ki dot l must be a multiple of ni. But moreover, Miranda and Pearson have shown in their work that these numbers must satisfy this integrality condition. Um, and mathematically, this again comes from certain lattice uh, properties of the, of the K3, but it really um, pertains explicitly to the torsional section part. And via the shoulder map arguments I gave in the first part of the talk, you can show that this intersection um, proper, uh, this intersection structure between the torsional section and the components of the SUN fiber actually means that tau generates a ZL subgroup of the full center that corresponds to the element K1, K2, and so forth in, inside this full center, center group. Okay, so this is the geometry part. Now let's look at the anomaly for this subgroup. So for that, I have to tell you how uh, such a subgroup, uh, how the background group of such a group, subgroup looks like. And in this case, um, again, if the subgroup is generated by K1, K2, etc., then in the full background field for the total product of the group, where I would have for each individual SUN factor an independent uh, background field, what a background for this group 
amount to do is simply setting, correlating all these background fields in this fashion. So a C2 background field for the C sub L symmetry corresponds to setting the individual parts inside each of the centers as multiples with factor K. Okay. So the general anomaly had this form, but now all the C's are correlated to a single independent background field with some Ki. And if you were paying attention earlier, or if you have a good memory, I should say, uh, about what the alphas are for Sun, then you find precisely this relation again in terms of this anomaly. So in other words, if I wanted to gauge a CL subgroup of SUN in AP, and where the CL is defined by these integers, then that condition has to hold. And if I go and look in the geometry of F theory uh, of a K3 surface, I find exactly the same relationship for torsional sections, which I know also correspond to some um, subgroups of, of the center. And by the, um, by the first part of the talk, we know that in the F theory interpretation, the torsional center, a torsional um, model veil group corresponds to having a uh, non-trivial gauge group structure modded out by this subgroup. And this precisely then corresponds in this case now to having a anomaly free one form symmetry. So with this explicit equation, one can also now check the bounds that I said earlier. So in particular given a concrete L, so I'm looking at Z sub L one form symmetry that I want to gauge. Then I can check just simply from this uh, exhaustively all the possible configurations of SUN subgroups, uh, SUN gauge groups and embeddings KI into their center such that this condition holds. And for the uh, for this um, rank bound, uh, if I introduce a rank bound, I get can make this, um, yeah, there's a basically a finite set of possibilities. Um, and just to say that the scan is exhaustive also for non-SU groups, um, because the anomalies for non-SU groups can basically be written as contributions of several SU subgroups inside that non-SU group. Um, so, right, and <laughs> the, um, the, uh, this, this condition, Explicitly fixes for the cases of L equals seven and eight, the only solutions that we have already observed in geometry. And furthermore, it also, just by exhaustively going through this exercise here, you find that there are no solutions within the rank bound for L bigger than eight. So as I promised, this is a very strong evidence for string universality uh, for possible allowed G mod Z subgroups at least an AD n equals one. Um, right, and uh, I cannot claim, unfortunately it's a explicit proof because of like these kind of smaller caveats we already seen earlier and I will comment on more in the next slide just to mention briefly here that it's kind of expected though that um, by this condition I'm probably not catching all the geometric restrictions, at least from K3, because just because not all lattice conditions for K3 just reduces to this condition here, of course. But also when we seen earlier, not all AD theories come from F theory. So maybe cases by that are missed by F theory can realize somehow differently in AD. But nevertheless, this strong correlation between these two conditions just at the formal levels already, at least to us, a pretty strong evidence for this claim. Can I, can I, yeah. can I, say something? I, I just, I, I think first, I think this is beautiful. Uh, Thanks. And, 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 and second, um, so, so first of all, you, 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 does this, I mean, this also works for CHL string sort of, to some extent. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, the formula should work for CHL strings. Right. I mean, it's a pure field theory. Argument. Right, right. But, the, but, the, but it also matches K3 constraints, right? Like you K, yeah. Right, right. Uh, okay. But, yeah. And, and I also wanted to, to know, is, is, there, is there any way to phrase these constraints just in terms of the charge lattice of, you know, uh, so an AD theory has an Arrhenius charge lattice, right? Which mm -hmm. secretly encodes 
it, it's a different way of encoding information you get in the K3. Yes. Is there, is there, is there like, a, the, how, what do these constraints look like from the point of view of the chart lattice? It's a very good question. I think um, this would be something worthwhile doing basically immediately and just try to translate all these kind of lattice conditions into field theoretic conditions. So, as I said, this condition for the torsional section and intersecting with reducible co dimension one fibers is also derived somehow from a lattice condition of K3, right? And, and, and what, we've done, what we've done is essentially showing that this corresponds to this particular field theoretic constraint. What right. I don't know, but yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to, to uh, what is, so these constraints from the lattice perspective, what is the principle, what are they imposing? Are they imposing that the lattice is, you know, self-dual or something like this? So, or? so, so uh, I cannot get this everything in detail, but basically the idea is that um, you can define a sub-lattice of the, uh, of the homology lattice of the K3 that is spanned by the, I n fibers, right? And then they show that on this um, the sub lattice, you can pull back somehow the intersection pairing from the homology lattice, which you can then interpret as a quadratic form on a abstract discriminant group, which they call it, right? Uh, so, so these are bounds. So these are bounds on the properties of the discriminant group. Yeah, 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 exactly. So this comes from the discriminant group bound. Okay, uh, that's or, yeah. yeah. That, that, is, that also has connections to weak gravity and... Uh, okay, it's very, that's very cool. All right. Yeah, as I said, I mean, we sort of just scratching the surface, but I thought when we stumble across this paper by Miranda and Tasson that has exactly the same structure, exactly the same equation, I thought it, it, it yeah, it was already pretty exciting to, to share with. It's super cool. Yeah. Thanks. So as I said, um, it's, it's not quite string universality in the sense that there are some caveats. Um, one we have seen already earlier is that these SP groups seem to be okay from the anomaly perspective, but are not realized in terms of known string constructions. So perhaps there are some more subtle AD anomalies for SP groups, and there's already some hints towards that in this work here, although that's a somewhat different flavor of anomalies. In, in, in fact, actually, they argue that these anomalies should be canceled, but they don't know how to cancel it. Um, so probably there is some more subtle story in general for SP groups. Can I make a comment there? Yeah. The, the, the anomalies that they talk about in, for, for SP groups in there, uh, they, they don't know how to cancel them with a TQFT when they're talking about uh, the, the theory in, you know, in eight dimensions. But if you compactify mm -hmm. on a sphere as they do, then the, the anomaly gets canceled because of the Bianchi identity. If you put mm -hmm. an instant on as they need to do to see the anomaly, you also need to put NS brains to cancel the, to cancel the tadpole. And that gives extra contributions, which, which cancels the anomaly. Right, okay. Uh, but in AD, they don't know how these kind of things can be added or, or what's the... They, 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 don't, they don't know how to do it directly in, in AD, but, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's understood, I think it's understood why this is, why the anomaly they find is not an obstacle for the existence of yeah, this. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, it's, it's an example of a, you could say it's, a, it's an example of an AD field theory, which is inconsistent because it has an anomaly, but it gets consistent once it's coupled to, to gravity because of the Bianca identity. So it's kind of like an anti swan plan. I see, I see. Very cool. That's very cool. Okay. Right. Anyways, um, let me just uh, finish up here. Um, so, Another thing that we're missing out is <clears throat> that we cannot really rule out products of anomaly free groups. So for example, we had SU9 mod C3. So in principle, you could also think about SU9 mod C3 times another SU9 mod C3 factor. That would not have this anomaly that we talked about, yet there is no K3 construction. However, there is one with SU3, SU9 squared modded out by diagonal Z3. So, Again, some, some, some structure seems to be there. It's not completely arbitrary, but, but we haven't been able to pinpoint that yet in terms of just the anomaly we talked about. Related to that is if I consider a subgroup L that is not of prime order, then the geometry 
<clears throat> of K3s and thus also the F theory realization seems to give at least one SUN factor where N is divisible by this L. Again, this does not have to be naively for field theory from the field theory perspective. For example, if I take Z2 and Z3, then there are these individually allowed factors. So there's no reason again from this product uh, uh, product um, issue, why I cannot take the product of two and form an acceptable theory. In that case, what you can do is just combine these two centers since they are co-prime into a total Z6. But again, this is not realized because there is no SU6 or SU12 or something like that. What, if you talk about Z6, then I think, again, some um, bells might ring. Namely, we know at least in this, in, 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 for the Saturn model, th it is possible if you also embed the C6 inside of U1. But geometrically, this is now an entirely different set of bounds um, since the, now, as we've seen in the first part of the talk, the C6 that is embedded inside the U1 is not tied to model little torsion. So if we are not bounded by all the discussions that we had. Moreover, on the K3, uh, there's also a subtlety that there can be U1 gauge factors that are not arising from sections. So it's entirely unclear at the moment how to incorporate those. But one thing that I thought might work is that perhaps in some way, you see that if you couple these two things together, secretly there must be also a U1 which participates in this C6 quotient. But as I said, this is just a hunch and I have no idea how to show it yet. Okay, so this brings me to the conclusions and I, I see I we're also um, a bit out of time. So in the first part, I have presented some more geometric arguments that show directly how in F theory, the model veil group imposes restrictions on the matter spectrum, which you can interpret as a non-trivial global gauge group structure of the form G mod C. Um, for non-abelian gauge symmetry, uh, this comes entirely from the torsion part of the model veil group, which has been classified in, in math and that seems to put many G mod C theories into the swampland. Um, to verify or to, to say definitively if this is true, we look at field theoretic constraints for having a G mod C gauge theory, which ba uh, based, which is based on the premise that one has to have a gauged one form symmetry, which necessarily has to have no anomalies. And in 61,0 theories, we've seen that these anomalies also uh, lead to an interesting interplay between strings and the complete and another swampland quantum gravity constraint. Um, for ADN equals one, these constraints become sharper, also in geometry. Um, and one can compare explicitly and see that almost all the swamp lengthy G mod C that we found earlier actually have an anomaly. So um, this brings me to the further uh, direction that we should pursue, namely that it's clear that there are some caveats that we've seen and highlighted, and this points towards additional constraint that go beyond this anomaly that we studied. Um, and in general, of course, if you think about the standard model um, and the phenomenological applications, we of course must include the one factors in this, uh, in, in this discussion to have a complete story. Mm. <clears throat> Similarly, um, I think what also would be interesting is to verify this kind of charge lattice argument that I've presented for why F theory has in general this non-trivial group structure in terms of really a explicit one form symmetry um, description. So if you think about the um, discrete zero form ZN symmetries, there has been, took some while in the literature, in F theory literature to, to really understand them in terms of the F theory duality, because what could happen was that once you go down to M theory, there was no ZN zero form gauge symmetries anymore, but uh, it's hidden more subtle in the geometry in terms of what also Miriam mentioned yesterday of the 
Teichahurich group or in general with Calabia torsos. Um, so it's conceivable though probably equally hard in this case to make that, uh, make the one form discrete symmetries precise through the MF theory duality. What I haven't mentioned at all is what about the dual magnetic symmetries? Right, so if you have an electric high form symmetry, you should have a magnetic one high form symmetry. And in 60, those would be three form symmetries. In 80, those would be five form symmetries. Um, they are also constrained by quantum gravity in the sense that they must either be gauged or broken. In particular, if the gauge group is just G, no quotient, then they must be gauged. So the question is, what are there any, and there probably are, but what are the obstructions to gauging them? And it's clear that, again, from the F theory example with Z7 or S to 7 cube, there must be some, since there is no S to 7 cube theory, so, but only the one where you have gauged the corresponding one form symmetry. So it'll be interesting to study that uh, in this context as well. And there are many other things that I haven't had time to mention. I'm sorry if I messed out um, some important references, but um, in any case, since I'm running over time, let me just thank you again for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Vielen Dank, Lin. Uh, any question from the audience? Yes, I have a question. Very nice talk, uh, very, very uh, powerful idea. So uh, one question I have is that you have, if I understand correctly, you're uh, using the gauging of one form symmetries as somehow having anomalies as a way to uh, rule out certain theories. Right. Could you have ruled out, uh, so, so, so that might naively say you cannot rule out the group by itself, only the center quotient thing, but Maybe you can apply it to other examples. For example, we know in, uh, in higher dimensions, like in 9D and so on, G2 does not appear as a gauge group in the landscape. And uh, you might say, well, that has nothing to do with the considerations you're having, but maybe it can be related it by viewing so, G2 as SO8 mod out by Z3 outer automorphism. And the question is that if you apply your ideas to outer automorphisms, can you rule out G2? <laughs> I think this would be, uh... I, I haven't thought about this uh, in detail, but indeed, um, this would be a suitable a, a generalization from that these kind of considerations. I, but for for those auto automorphisms, um, I I don't know a priori if there are similar kind of shifts of background symmetries, etc., background fields that can be phrased in terms of anomaly. But it, I think I, I probably as as quantum gravity teaches us if you have some symmetry, there must be some background feel that tells you in case they are okay, that you can gauge them. So I expect that there should be some interplay also with these kind of discrete symmetries floating around, but I haven't, yeah. It, I, I think it's just scratching the surface of all these things. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just have one basic question. Um, thank you, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, for when you, when you describe the anomaly in terms of realizing this quotient group as the result of taking the original group and gauging a one form symmetry, could you also just compute them by look by computing the global anomaly with the proper, you know, the, the quotiented gauge group structure and not having to talk about this procedure? So um, I think, I think what this kind of turning on background field pr uh, perspective tells you essentially is that um, if you start with this quotiented group right away, then there are instanton configurations in that theory, which are fractional from in, in, with some respect to certain quantization right. conditions. And, and, and if that quantization condition is now in our case tied to another symmetry, which for consistency of the theory has to be gauged, then that right away gives you the anomaly or the, the, the ambiguity that, that forbids you to turning, that tells you that this thing is not consistent. So indeed, sure. from that perspective, you don't have to start with SUN and then mod out that. And I think it's just owned to the, to, yeah, the, the, the way that this, this has been approached in, in the more theoretic literature. Good, thanks. Uh, earlier you talked about some anomaly between uh, one form symmetry in six dimension and uh, hello, Lakshya. Uh, a gate symmetry, uh, two, uh, two form gate symmetry. Uh, 
Yeah. Sorry, you broke off for a bit. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, earlier in six dimension, you were talking about an anomaly between one form symmetry and uh, a gauge symmetry. Mm -hmm. uh, is, there, is there a simple example of 60s safety where this shows up? Yeah. Where you, where you mean this, this anomaly shows up? Well, yeah, what would be a simple example of a 60s CFT where one form symmetry so, is an anomaly? Yeah, so for example, if you just take um, E6, E6 conformal matter, right? Okay. This has on the tensor branch, this SU3 in the middle, mm -hmm. where you don't have a priori any mass that's had a multiple bits charge under it. So you could think that it has a, S, a Z3 one form symmetry. Uh -huh. But if you compute the anomaly involved uh, involving the two E strings, essentially, that are attached mm -hmm. to this SU3, you find that these give you this anomaly. Okay. And, and since we talked, I, I, mean, I already mentioned the strings, it's easily understood from the fact that these strings now carry some excitations and those will be charged under the discrete, uh, under the center of the SU3. So in some sense, they explicitly break that symmetry. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, just actually, if I could intercept about this example, um, mm -hmm. We know that that doesn't have a one from symmetry from geometric arguments. Yes. It also relates to the third point that you made there that Brian and Dave and I discussed in our papers, the one from symmetry really in these non-compact models is determined by the asymptotic, like the boundary of the geometry, mm -hmm. right? Right. So in that sense, that is sort of a confirmation of that rather than... Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so you so, see that these strings actually are charged and they break the one form. Right. Ex exactly. Yes. yes. So in fact, what do you actually mean by this uh, mapping between M and F duality? Because uh, in M theory, you understand this again from these asymptotics of the... So, okay. So, so what I mean here function. by this, yeah, what I mean here by this MF duality is really now you know, think about what we did with this multi-section stuff, right? So in here, I, I really had in mind the, this kind of torsional section that takes this sure. weird Shioda map. And I want to really now make the statement that somewhere hidden in the Shioda map, I can read off like a one form symmetry, uh, one form, a, a discrete gauge field for the one form symmetry. Mm -hmm. That's what I had in mind. So, so, so I you agree could with also all... interpret it as coming from you have in 60, say, a theory with a one form symmetry, for example, S08 on a minus four curve has a one form symmetry. Yes. And you could ask what is the theory as you now go through the reduction to a 5D theory, right? Right. In that case, I think it's a much more straightforward identification of the, the higher form symmetries. Indeed, indeed. So, so, as I said, I mean, if you look at I think what I had in mind really is in terms of these kind of compact models, compact geometries yeah, where the sections are made explicit, similar to how yeah. this bisection sense. There's and some, indeed, there's some problem that I see also discussing this in the compact model because in that case, right, you really would imagine that both same 60, the one form symmetry is broken, but also the three form symmetry has to be broken or gauged, yeah. right? So once you, you usually in a non-compact model, you have say a one form symmetry, you can gauge it, you can get a three form symmetry right. and vice versa. Exactly, so I yeah. think in the compact models, um, indeed this is a slightly different discussion. Right, so, so at some point I, I, I was wondering about in compact models, right? What is the, how does the geometry tell you which of the two or what the isotropic subgroup of the two is actually gauged? Yes. Because you know something has to be gauged. No, I don't. So, so at, at best, what I can say is that if I have a torsional section, I know, mm -hmm. or, or, or if I have this kind of shoulder map for the also involving U1, then there is this one form symmetry that's gauged. But that's based on this kind of charge lattice descriptions, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, or more precisely, yeah, it, it, you have really have to assume that everything, every state is populated somehow in terms of some M2 brain state. Mm -hmm. but it would be nice sort of to, yeah, you know, I can keep coming back to this discrete symmetry picture where you start with a ZK zero form gauge symmetry, you go on a circle, you mix it with a U1 
KK, and suddenly you end mm -hmm. up with a, another U1 gauge which you see explicitly in terms of M theory reduction. So, mm -hmm. so the question is, can I see something similar if I do it for the one form symmetry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I had in mind okay. there. Yeah. Any more questions, comments? Uh, well, maybe just a minor comment. I mean, the hope is that, you know, in A dimensions, you also have higher form terms in principle that couple, right? To, and also what uh, comes there more prominently is coupling between this gauge degrees and the gravity itself. So uh, there is a hope that uh, one could in principle retrieve some more constraints also from this analysis and that right. you know, coupling to gravity at, at some level should Indeed, be further, yeah. uh, put further stronger constraints, but these are just, you know, words at this point, not concretely right. realized yet. I mean, so are these, so, <laughs> but I think it's, yeah, it, 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 indeed, there are many open questions. So I haven't mentioned it here, of course, but other topics that are naturally connected are now mixings with other higher forms of metrics, for example, in 60, you have the defect groups, um, in the, and in 80, I don't even know what, what they are. Um, but then the question is, could they somehow conspire to give you some higher uh, two group, three group structures in this kind of story? So um, all that is, is, is still completely out there as a, on the to-do list. Great. In any case, I think we should thank uh, Leaning first and uh, more question we can ask later. Es war uns eine große Ehre, dass Daktelin seine Vortrag hielt. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> very good pronunciation. I did learn German before. Oh, okay. That's, that, I guess that helps. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for, for the invitation. I hope I hope I